Father, we just uh, just want to pause here on a beautiful afternoon and just thank you for your blessings, for your leading in our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would indeed send the Holy Spirit to tabernacle within us, that you might, Father, help us to uh, be able to glean some things from our time together. May it be time well spent and not just a wasted hour and a half. We pray, Lord, also that you would um, that you would just continue to guide us in our lives. There's so many distractions out there. Um, trying to pull us away from you, trying to pull us away from time in the word and, and time on our knees. And I pray, Lord, that we might, as your people, prioritize our life in such a way that we put you first. So bless your people today. Bless us uh, as we're here with your, your guidance and with your love, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Brandon Westgate, and I am currently serving as youth director and camp director for the Arkansas-Louisiana Conference. Anybody here ever been involved in youth ministries? Any of you guys? I'll hold your hand up because I got something for you. If you've ever been involved in youth ministries, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> Who else was it? Hey, you guys have. Yeah, there you go. Now you want to be, right? Cameraman coming back there right at you. Man, got him. Anybody else? Oh, back there by the door. <laughs> all right, that's all right. He's a pathfinder leader. Who is? That guy right there? All right. I got a few more of those. I may give them away to a couple of volunteers in a minute. It's fun working with youth, and um, and youth has they've really been a blessing for me just being involved um, with the youth. And and so I'm going to talk about youth just for a couple of minutes, and I want to share a couple of things with you because some of this stuff is just too good to keep um, to yourself. And I go around and I do week of prayers. And, um, and I do special youth rally weekends around our conference and some of those things. And it's just really a, a fun thing for me. One of the things I do during my week of prayers is I have them, I do an ask the pastor day where they can ask me literally anything they want to ask me. And um, I usually separate that into a, an everybody session. And then I separate and make a PG-13 session um, because some of our uh, young adults, tweens, our, our early teens, they've got questions that they're afraid to ask their teacher, they're afraid to ask mom and dad, they're afraid to ask even their pastor sometimes. But after I spent a few days with them, I do this on Thursday, by the way, um, there's a trust that we build and a rapport we have with each other by then. And they're really able to ask me questions that are really serious about just all kinds of stuff. I've got some of those questions here. There's no names, you don't know these kids anyway. Um, But some of them are humorous, some of them are Uh, just kind of a gateway into what's going on in some of these kids' lives. I thought I'd just share a couple of these with you. Um, How do you know that you're going to heaven or not? I'm scared that I'm not. Yeah, I answer these, by the way, right when they ask them. I collect them and I answer these. It takes a couple hours sometimes, but it's worth it. I have an addiction to something that I don't want to do, but I can't stop. How can I stop? You can't on your own. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, what God do Muslims worship? Do you think, uh, what do you think of witnessing to Muslims? How should we, we be a witness to them? You never know what kids are thinking, huh? Is having babies a gift from God because I think it's disgusting? <laughs> question two, why does having babies have to be so disgusting? <laughs> and question three, something actually when we talked about this that one of her friends was dealing with, is it bad to get pregnant in your teens? Yeah, teen pregnancy, it's a big deal. When should your first kiss be? You may kiss the bride, right? You know what they, that's a challenge. How can we get Satan to stop tempting us? Where will Satan go when the world ends? And why are women bossy? <laughs> Satan, Satan, women. I thought that was an interesting progression. Yeah, I guess. If you're sinning on the day Jesus comes, are you going to heaven? Are you going to heaven? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Why do we have to suffer? Hmm, that's heavy duty, huh? Um, You'll find different questions. I probably got three or four in here um, that are that are really kind of the same thing. I get this one a lot. Who made God? You know, where did God come from? How did God make angels? This was cute. How many animals are there? That's nice. Um, Why do people that were raised as Christian from childhood do more wrong and tend to get away from God than people that found God older and had problems in their life? Why are they closer to God? That's a perception. I don't believe that that's true. 
but I think that's a perception that some people have. Um, why did Lucifer turn bad? It's a good question, son. Huh? Yeah, some of these are fun questions that they ask. What's your favorite time of the year? Who put it in your mind to become a Christian? Why are there shows on TV about ghosts and they show that it's real? Are ghosts real? Are UFOs real? Here's one I get a lot. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do good things happen to bad people? And then the other side of that is why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? How can God help us? Yeah. People on the History Channel say they found out what Jesus looked like. Is that bad to know? I don't know. Um, how did God been made? A little kindergartner. How was God made? Why did God create people even when they knew they would do wrong things? Good questions, huh? Yeah, I keep those in my Bible box here. Got one of those remnant Bibles, and I got a few extras in there. But um, your young people in your church, you need to know their name. You need to know what their favorite dessert is, and you need to know what they're watching on their television at home so you can learn to relate to them. Please lose this phrase from your vocabulary, and I hear it in almost every church I go in as an introduction, as a way they introduce me. As a youth director of our conference, we really appreciate the youth. The youth are the future of our church. You know what the youth hear when you say that? They hear we're not important today, maybe someday we will be. That's what they hear. And you know what you hear when you say that? We acknowledge the youth is present, but they're no longer and not even close to being relevant yet. That's what that does. The youth is the church today. And running summer camp this summer, the Holy Spirit was just really thick at our summer camp, Camp Yorktown Bay. And um, I saw young people just transformed. And it's an amazing thing when they have an encounter with Christ that way. It's a beautiful thing. How many of you were raised, how many of you are Seventh-day Adventists? Is anybody here that's not a Seventh-day Adventist? I don't want to call anybody out. I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist, okay? Um, was not, never attended church as a young person, came to Christ, to know Christ later. That's another seminar. Um, we could talk about that for a long time. At any rate, um, I have always found it interesting the way that uh, we get our perspectives and everybody has a different perspective based on how you were raised, where you were raised, uh, socioeconomic conditions, educational uh, abilities or lack thereof of your parents, grandparents, all of that stuff plays into how you perceive things and how you see things going on around you. And, um, and if you guys, have, how many, how many have, have been, were raised Seventh-day Adventists from the time they were a little kid? Anybody in here? All right, that's cool, that's fine. First generation, that's good. I, I met a guy this summer, he worked for me at camp. He's an eighth generation Seventh-day Adventist. I didn't know they were that far along yet. Isn't that cool? Yeah, he's, his, uh, he's going to be, I think, four generations now of pastors, Seventh-day Adventist pastors in his family. It's a cool thing, isn't it? David Clark's his name, young guy, and he's, he's got a bright future. He wants to be a youth pastor. Pray for him, um, I'll tell you. But anyway, um, here's what I'd like to do. And, I, and I could, I've done this a bunch, and I could just tell you guys how it works, or I could show you. And to me, we got a couple of minutes here, and so I just want to show you. So what I need is two volunteers. Uh, some people are just brave enough just to volunteer. Come on, sister. And I need one more volunteer. Just one more. It can be anybody. I'm not picky. Harry, come on up. I met Harry earlier. I just met him. I don't know him. This is not prearranged, okay? Tell me your name again. Shimon. Shimon. All right, come on around here. Act like you like each other, okay? All right, we're going we're gonna, to, you guys know what role-playing is, right? Role-playing. We're going to do a little bit of role-playing, okay? okay? And, um, and here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going um, to have Shimon here be your friend that you've worked with for a few years, or you've seen her at Walmart, and you keep running into each other, and all these kinds of things. This is Harry, by the way, Shimon Harry. And, um, and, and Harry here is um, he's a faithful member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and, uh, and he understands its doctrines, customs, beliefs, practices, and all those things, all the theology and liturgy and all the customs and all those things. And uh, she's noticed some things about you, and so well, here's what I want you to ask him. And you can be whatever you want to be, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Hindu, doesn't really matter, okay, whatever you want to be. So she's a non-Adventist. She's a non-Adventist, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. You're on our list. <laughs> Amen. But, but here's what we're going to do. 
Um, what I want you to do is I just want you to ask him a question. And the question I want you to ask him is, what's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventist? Okay? And I just want to see how this goes. You want me to answer? Oh, yeah. I just want you to answer. Okay. So oh, yeah. Just, no, oh, no. It's fine. It's fine. Hey, whatever you want to do. That's fine. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. How you been? What's up with that? Yeah. What do you mean? What? I mean, explain. I, I, mean, I hear, but I don't know. What is, what is, I just... Oh, well, I don't know. I guess I, I suppose we're probably like anybody else who, any other Christian who uh, bases their beliefs on Scripture. Um, but, first thing most people notice is that we go to church on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So we keep Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, mm -hmm. like the Jews still do, always have. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, I'm a Baptist, so, I mean, we, in the Bible, we were speaking in tongues. Do you be speaking in tongues? I don't yeah. think you do. I mean, you know. No, no, we don't. At least I haven't met any that do. Well, I mean, but. the Bible says, you know, have the gift of tongues. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I believe the gift of tongues is uh, communication. It, God allows us to communicate with each other. So why don't you that, do it in your church? Pardon me? Why don't you do it in your church? Well, because we all speak the same language. <laughs> all right, we're going to stop right there. I appreciate it. Give him, a, give him a round of applause. Thanks, Harry. I appreciate that. Did you get a Frisbee? Did you guys get Frisbees? Yes, if you give me another. All right, you can give it to somebody else. Thank you so much. I hit my son in the head. All right, here's, here's, <clears throat> and this is the deal right here, because at some point somebody's going to ask you that question. What's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists? And, um, and Harry, I appreciate your response. And, uh, and the reason I chose Harry uh, to, be the, uh, to be the Adventist is because I, I know he can accept some constructive criticism and, and that he's not going to hold a grudge against me. You're not, right? If we talk about, because I'm going to tell you, his response is the response I get 90 plus percent of the time. People ask you about your Adventism and we respond the way that Harry responded and that not that there's anything necessarily wrong about what he responded, but we need to realize this, and this is something that maybe you don't want to think about too often. Um, but really, when somebody asks you that question, maybe they've met you at Walmart, maybe they've seen you about before, but this, um, the answer really is life or death for that individual. And she was asking you, whether you realize it or not, Harry, a life or death question for her, potentially, especially if she's a non-believer. What's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists? And so here's the challenge for us Adventists. It's how do we present Bible truth? Because you went right to scriptures and Sabbath. Did you guys notice that? Scriptures and Sabbath. He even threw Jew out there. Did you hear that? I mean, those are the key words that I heard. You guys heard? You, um, okay. And, and that's what he heard. How do we present Bible truth in a way that's not offensive and yet does not compromise? Because we don't want to compromise truth. And, and I believe the answer to that lies in our unique understanding. And you say understanding of what? Well, we'll get to it. But let's look at these pointers right here. And you can look at these in any witnessing guidebooks. And you're going to find that these common points are things that you really need to keep in mind when you witness. Now, I, I share this presentation for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason is this. I truly believe that we are living in the last days of earth's history. I really believe that. Adventists still believe that. Amen? Amen. Uh, we really do. And, and because of that, I've really stepped up the game on myself when it comes to witnessing. And so I witness to everybody. <laughs> Literally. I embarrass my wife sometimes because I'll be pumping gas at Walmart. And, and that guy across from me, he's going to hear about Jesus. Whether he planned it that day or not, he's going to hear about Jesus. And I'm not going to do it in a way that's offensive. I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to find common ground. You know what I'm going to say? Beautiful day, isn't it? And what's he going to say? Yeah, hot. Oh, man, hot day today. Arkansas, 103, I think, when I left. Hot today. Oh, man, that's hot. Isn't God good, though? Yes. Common ground. Find common ground. Agree before you move on. Yeah, it's hot. It is hot. But isn't God good? Now we're going to go back and see if we can find some more common ground. And if you can't find agreement, hey, check out guy in Walmart there in uh, Conway, Arkansas one day. Had about five holes in his ear. I don't guess they would let him wear all his jewelry. He had tattoos creeping up from under his shirt. And uh, he did. And, and he was there checking. And I said, beautiful day. And he said, yeah, it's a good day. I said, isn't God good? He said, well, I guess if you're into that kind of thing. You never know what you're going to get, right? Bible Belt, usually they say, oh, man, God is good. If you can't find agreement, this is where the rubber meets the road. You need to offer to study with them, okay? You need to offer to spend some time with them 
to not to prove your point, but to see where they're coming from and to try to solidify some sort of agreement there. And you say, this is hard. Is there some sort of guide I can use to help me? Yes, there is. There is a guide. And uh, this is a really cool part. It's not from Amazing Facts. Now, I love Amazing Facts. <laughs> Doug does a good work. Amen? Amen? I do. But this guide, is, uh, it's, it's, it's been around um, a lot longer than that. Wasn't engineered by man, been around li literally forever. It's easy to remember. And this is the fun part. Uh, most of you have it memorized already and you just don't know it. It's a blueprint, really. It's a guide for witnessing that I have used. And I'm going to tell you, it has really upped my game when it comes to witnessing. Because here's what happens. People come up and they ask you, what's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists? And you talk about Sabbath and veggie links. <laughs> All right? And they think you're a Jew who doesn't know how to eat. <laughs> and, uh, and they go, wow, what is wrong with you? Um, and they'll say something like, because um, I've done this so many times, they'll say, Sabbath, I thought that was nailed to the cross. Oh, no, it wasn't nailed to the cross. My pastor said it wasn't. Well, my pastor said it was. Well, here's my pastor's phone number. You call him and, and he'll set you straight, right? And we punt to the pastor. It, this is familiar, isn't it? Isn't that how it goes? Here's my blueprint for witnessing. Amen. You guys know what that is, right? How many of you have never seen that before in your life? Yeah, it's part of our culture as Adventists. Do you know if there's one unique doctrine in Seventh-day Adventism? It's the sanctuary message. It is the unique doctrine in Seventh-day Adventism. Other uh, denominations, other churches understand, recognize the Sabbath, and they observe the Bible Sabbath. There's other uh, churches who understand the health message. They actually live the health message, by the way, which is kind of a cool thing. There are other churches out there who understand what happens when you die. They understand the, the Trinity. But this is unique to Seventh-day Adventism is our understanding of the sanctuary. So what you're saying, Pastor, is you want me to teach the sanctuary to these people I'm trying to witness to? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't want you to do that at all. What I've done is this. I, I did, a, in my first district I was pastoring, I did a five-night, one-hour night series through the sanctuary. And as I was engaged in that study and really engrossed preparing for, those, uh, for that series of meetings, um, this thing just popped. It just kind of came to me. And I've used it ever since. And so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of real-life situations that have happened to me and the way I was able to use this. And, and how this thing actually works for me, okay? Um, I've got a neighbor who moved in across, I moved in across the street from him about, uh, I guess it's been two and a half years ago in Harrison, Arkansas. It's up almost near Branson, Missouri, about a half an hour. That's where our home still is. Still for sale. If you need a house, let me know. Um, uh, at any rate, we moved in. I was there maybe two weeks, and my neighbor, Bill, who is retired, uh, came across the street to introduce himself to me. And uh, Bill is one of those guys, he cuts his grass twice a week at least, and, uh, and any time I talk to Bill, I better have 15 minutes to kill because he's retired. He's got plenty of time to talk. He's a super guy. He's actually now the chaplain at the volunteer fire department there in Harrison. Just a really neat guy. But at any rate, Bill came up, and he was small talking, and I was kind of needing to go. I was actually going to do some visitations. And Bill said at, he was, what he was really coming down to, he was trying to invite me to church. I thought, that's a cool thing. You know, I hope, I hope when my parishioners see somebody new move into their neighborhood, they invite them to church. You know, that would be a cool thing. And Bill said, uh, do you have a church? I said, actually, Bill, I'm the new pastor in town, Seventh-day Adventist Church over there. Oh, Seventh-day Adventist. What's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists? <laughs> That's what he said. I I've heard about you. What's up? What's up with Seventh-day Adventists? So here's what I told Bill. Because here's what most people do. Um, and, and I'm not going to pick on you, Harry, because it happens, and I could have picked anybody else in here, and they would have done what you did, Okay. We try to kick in the back door of the sanctuary and get to the good stuff first. That's what we try to do. And we, we want to get to the law. Okay, we want to get to the Sabbath. We want to get to all that stuff. And we don't want them to leave our presence without having heard that stuff. And so we bleh, throw up on them all the Sabbath and veggie links and all that stuff and, um, and try to get a conversion in about 20 seconds. And it doesn't happen that way. Um, so here's what I've done. Everybody know what that is right there? It's an altar, a burnt offering. It's symbolic of, that's where the sacrifice was made, by the way. Everybody knows how the sanctuary works. 
Does anybody not know? Should I just run through this real quick? Give me three minutes, okay? And we'll run through this because it's important you understand what the sanctuary is. The sanctuary was this. It was a way for us to become one with God after we had sinned. Sin separates us from God. The sanctuary was designed in such a way that we could bring a sacrifice, a substitute, substitutionary atonement. It's one of those big theological words. We bring a substitute to this place that is killed in our stead. So let's go back in time a little bit uh, to the time of the sanctuary. I have a daughter, by the way, Sylvia. She's 15 now. She's growing up fast. And um, my daughter, Sylvia, at 15, um, got an iPhone. <laughs> her money, she bought her own iPhone. And, and I get her stuff, and I'm, I spoil my kids. Somebody tell me that they don't spoil their kids. Uh, yeah, okay, that's good. Harry, you're a good guy. Um, now, she gets pretty much whatever she, whatever she wants, pretty much, within reason. Um, if, if I was living in the time of the sanctuary, my daughter... If her birthday was coming up and I was going to get her something, there were no iPhones or laptops or, or text messaging, none of that stuff. Maybe I'd get her a little baby lamb. That would be cute. She would love that. She would. She would brush it and tie a bow on it, I'm sure. And uh, what's a good name for a little baby lamb? Somebody give me a name. Bo. What? Bo. Bo? Bo the lamb. Okay. My daughter would probably name it Bob, but Bo is good. <laughs> And she would take this little lamb and she would probably put a leash on it and lead it around and pet it and all that kind of stuff. Well, Sylvia goes off to school one day, it's been a couple of months, and dad is, uh, has an opportunity by himself to get himself into trouble. And dad goes out and he jumps off into some sin. And um, we say we fall into sin, like we were just walking along, didn't see it, and whoa, oh, oh, sin. But really we know there's warnings and barricades and danger, don't go there, right? And we just kind of dive off in anyway right? That's what happens. And so dad dives off into some sin and he realizes after he's sinned it up for a while and come out of that, that he's dirty and, and he's repentant and he needs to make that right. And he realizes that there is a way for him to get right again. And so he goes home and he has to find something suitable for sacrifice. Oh, and he finds Bo, huh? Yeah, and he takes the leash, and he leads Bo, who's very obedient, because he's been following his daughter for weeks. And he takes her to the sanctuary, little Bo the lamb, and Bo ends up here at the altar. And the, uh, the father then, dad, he puts his hand on the head of Bo, and he confesses his sins, and by faith, not by works, by faith believes his sins are now transferred to the lamb. He is innocent, but the wages of sin is death, the priest actually hands dad the knife and he cuts the lamb's throat and the blood runs on his hand and the priest captures some in the bowl and he ministers to it, sorry about that, he ministers to it inside the, the holy place here. They cut up the lamb, process it, put it on that altar of burnt offering. Dad walks away, Bo never does. Sanctuary. Substitutionary atonement. Praise the Lord for it, Amen. Amen. All right. This altar here is symbolic of something. And so my neighbor Bill, getting back to my neighbor Bill, he says, um, what's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists? And here's what I tell him. Um, I don't tell him veggie links and Sabbath. I don't tell him that. What I do tell him is this. I say Seventh-day Adventists are people who believe that God loves us so much that he sent his son down to planet Earth to take on the form of a man. He came willingly, he lived a righteous life before the world, and he, because he loved us so much, chose to die for us rather than live without us. And it's by his grace and his grace alone that I am saved. You know what my neighbor Bill said? That's exactly what he said, Harry. He said, I believe that. Bill, wants, he attends one of those three-letter churches BNC or whatever, those are popping up all over the place. It's, if you've ever been into one, it's, uh, they build these big metal buildings, and uh, if you, when you go in, it's like a concert hall. It's kind of rocking a bit. It's a bunch of Christian contemporary music, pretty loud. I call it Christianity light, because um, they get amped up, and they hear a good sermon on faith, hope, love, and Jesus, and go get them, you know, and, and that's it. There's not a lot of depth. There's not a lot of meat, but it's a feel-good kind, and that's where Bill's at, okay? He's, he's in that, and uh, so Bill said... He recognized some things there. Jesus, faith, right? Love and, and, and grace. And he said, I, I believe that. I believe that. What else do you believe? Now, let me ask you a question. When somebody asks you about Adventism, how many of you have ever gotten to that point? <laughs> For them to say, I believe that. What else do you believe? It's rare, though, isn't it? It is. It's rare. Look what else I said. So I told Bill. How many know what that is right there? 
That's the laver. It, it was for cleansing. It's symbolic of washing. It's baptism. And so Bill says, what else do you buy? I said, Bill, when, when we, I believe that when we recognize what Jesus has done for us, I know this thing is debatable and it's on and on, never in debate. When is somebody ready for baptism, right? Um, I believe that when you, when you recognize what Jesus has done for you, when you recognize you're saved by his grace, the Bible calls us to do something about that. It's baptism. And baptism is by immersion, by the very word baptism, to plunge under. And, and you know what my neighbor Bill said? I believe that. I believe that. What else do you believe? <laughs> Isn't this cool? Yeah. Have I said sanctuary to Bill at all? No, I haven't said, I, and I don't. I don't. This is in my head. How many of you, if I blanked out that screen, could draw that right now on a piece of paper? How many could do that? Yeah, you could draw it. Sure. Because you know this already, right? So Bill says, what else do you believe? I said, well, how many know what that is right there? Yeah, it's that show bread, right? Jesus says in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. And Bill says, so what else do you believe? I said, Bill, I believe that when we, when we recognize what Jesus has done and we're baptized, it's the beginning of a relationship with him and that we need to get to know him better by feeding on his word every day. Adventists are people of the book. We used to be. We still are, aren't we? Amen. Yeah, we still are. And you know what my neighbor Bill said? I believe that. My pastor was just telling us this last week that we need to read our Bibles more. Beautiful, huh? Praise the Lord for that pastor who's telling his parishioners to read the Bible, huh? That's becoming a lost art. Yeah, the bread of life. And Bill said, what else do you believe? I said, well, how many know what that is right there? Yeah, altar of incense. It was wooden pulp, you know, wood pulp, and they mixed it with perfume is what they did. And when it burned, it put off a lot of smoke. I'm told that whole place was filled with smoke because it went up right through the tent top there. And it was, that wood pulp is symbolic of our prayers and that perfume is symbolic of Jesus' prayers mixed together. Jesus told Peter, I prayed for you, you know. That's why we pray in Jesus' name, right? Because he prays with us. Holy Spirit takes our prayers and makes it something the Lord can say yes to. That's a beautiful thing. I'm glad that he does that. And so I, Bill said, what else do you believe? I said, Bill, Seventh-day Adventists are a praying people. We believe in prayer, in the power of prayer. And we believe that God not only hears, but he answers our prayers. What do you think my neighbor Bill said? I believe that. He said there was this lady at our church. She was sick. The doctors had given up all hope. We prayed for her. She was in church last week. She's doing fine. How many of you have seen things like that? Man, I have. I saw it this summer. We had a, we had a staff member. And he went down, and he went down hard. Dehydration, he was throwing up, he was doing all this stuff, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, took him to the local clinic. They med-flighted him to Little Rock, to the children's hospital there. And um, he was in a regular room. The next day, he was in ICU. He was going down fast. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. We went and anointed him. And we asked the Lord for revelation so that these doctors could figure out what's going on and for them to heal him that same day, that evening, a doctor came in, looked at him, asked him two or three questions, diagnosed him, tested him, they figured out what it was, and he was better in three days. <laughs> the Lord does that, amen? He does that. Seventh-day Adventists are people who believe in prayer. That's what I told Bill. He said, what else do you believe? <laughs> Isn't this cool? Yeah, I, this thing works. I've used this countless times. It, it's just a blueprint, just an easy way to remember how, what do we need? We need to put first things first, don't we? We need to put first things first. So he says, what else do you believe? I said, well, how many know what that is right there? Candlesticks. Yeah, King James Version says candlesticks, and, and this is probably not the best translation. It's lampstand's probably a better translation. Candlestick implies you put a candle in it and burns you, throw it out, and put another one. It was fueled by something, though. Anybody remember what it was fueled by? Olive oil. Olive oil. That's right, first cold pressed, E-V-O-O, -O, right? If you're a Rachel Ray fan, that's what she calls it. And... Um, you know where they got that? Because they didn't go down to Sam's Club or a Costco and buy it in a 50-gallon drum. Yeah, it was a free will offering that the people had to bring. And if they didn't bring, the lights went out. Think 10 virgins in their lamps. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Had to haul it, huh, from Egypt. Yeah, they carried it with them. So this is a beautiful thing. Um, what's, what's oil symbolic of in Scripture? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And that light that was lit from that lamp is the only source of light in that sanctuary. And so Bill says, what else do you believe? Yeah, this gets fun. I told Bill, I said, here's what Adventists believe, Bill. And, um, and I told him this because it's what I believe. 
And I'm going to challenge you with this to not lie to people. Don't lie to people. It's one of those commandments. A good Adventist doesn't break those, you know. Um, the reason I say that is this, is because I told Bill, I told him, Bill, I believe because I have studied. I believe that when I study and pray that the Holy Spirit shines light on God's Word and helps me to see the spiritual impact of what I read. Seventh-day Adventists believe that, don't we? We do. You know what my neighbor Bill said? I believe that. I believe that. The Lord has shown me things in Scripture myself. As I prayed and studied, the Lord has shown me things. He can do that, can't he? Do you know if you're going to talk about veggie links, <laughs> and I don't care if you do or not, that's fine. Um, this is the context that that needs to be done in. If you are a vegetarian or vegan or whatever it is, um, because you're trying to fit into some church doctrine, because you're trying to elevate your spiritual existence, or because you think Jesus is going to love you more, have mercy. Um, that's the wrong motivation. It's the completely wrong motivation. Uh, totally wrong motivation. Um, if you recognize, however, that the Holy Spirit tabernacles within you, and, and that you want a clean house for the Holy Spirit to reside in, and you have chosen to put the best fuel possible into your body temple, and you have seen, because of what you've read, because of what you've heard, because of what, that, that a vegetarian or vegan diet is best to do that, praise the Lord, because you're doing it for the right motivation then. Okay? Do you know there's nothing you can do to make Jesus love you anymore? He already loves you with a perfect love. God is not looking... For, for you to put on this great performance for him. Oh, look, they were early for Sabbath school. I love them more today. <laughs> it's sad because I've met a lot of Adventists that, are, that feel that way. Oh, man, I didn't stay for potluck. I hope, hope God doesn't love me less. Mercy, huh? There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less either. Did you know that? While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Perfect love, irregardless of your job performance. God is not looking for job performance. He's looking for surrendered hearts. That's what he's looking for. So I told my neighbor Bill that because I have studied and prayed, the Holy Spirit, I believe, has shown me some things in Scripture. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to give me spiritual gifts and insight. My neighbor Bill said, I believe that. Now, if you're talking to a Baptist friend about the Holy Spirit, are they going to agree with you? Yeah, if you talk to your Pentecostal friend about the Holy Spirit, you think they're going to agree with you? Oh, yeah. Hallelujah, right? Oh, yeah, they're going to agree with you. They are. Have I said anything so far that any of your Christian friends would have a problem with? No, no. do you know why? Because it's all biblical. It's all scriptural, isn't it? And so is the next thing, because Bill says, what else do you believe? Now, how many remember what that little, that little spot right there? It's not really a, a circle there on the top, but the mercy seat. Yeah, praise the Lord. Do you know the only way you can get to God's law is through His mercy? That's the only way you can get there. That's the only way you can get there. We've already broken the law. Amen? And now we need His mercy. Amen? And so God says this, that I love you in spite of what you've done and where you've been. I still love you. I still love you. And so Bill says, what else do you believe? And so I'm going to reiterate here. I said, Bill, I believe that when we recognize what Jesus has done, the way that He loves us so much, and we enter into a relationship with Him, as we study and pray, the Holy Spirit blesses us with insight, and we're able to see some things. And he says, okay, what else do you believe? I said, Bill, I believe because I have studied, I believe that when the Lord calls us into relationship with Him, He's also calling us into obedience with Him. You know what my neighbor Bill said? I believe that. I believe that. I do believe the Lord is calling us to obey His will. I said, beautiful, Bill, that's what I believe. He said, what else do you believe? Oh, Bill, I believe in a God of mercy. A God who is able to cover my sins every time I mess up. He is willing and able to cover my sins. You know what my neighbor Bill said? I believe that. What else do you believe? I said, Bill, as Seventh-day Adventists, those are the things we believe. He said, now, hold, 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 wait a minute. Um, you guys go to church on Saturday. I said, yeah, we sure do. He says, what's that all about? I said, Bill, it's, it's one of those things that I was talking about. When you have a relationship with Jesus, he calls you to be obedient. He says, 
Yeah, but why Saturday? I said, it's that it's, you've heard of the Ten Commandments? They're posted inside my church. I said, Bill, the Lord is calling us to be obedient even to those Ten Commandments. Well, I believe that. I believe that. I said, Bill, it's the fourth one. It, it talks about the seventh day and, and how we're, we're to rest and, and really and how we're to, to have a relationship with him on that day. And he says, wow, I'll have to study that. I'll have to study that. I said, well, Bill, I can, I can schedule some time. I know you're busy. Retired. He wasn't busy. Um, but, uh, I, you know, if, if you got some time, I'd be happy to set aside some time and study with you. Or I have some literature on that subject, I could give, I'd take some literature. And so two and a half years ago, I handed Bill a piece of literature on the Sabbath. And I wish I could tell you today, my neighbor Bill is a Seventh-day Adventist today, but he's not. Do you know what? That's not my job. To, it's not my job to convert Bill because I can't convert Bill. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And, and I think that's where a lot of the discouragement comes in with us as we go out to witness is that we think we ought to see conversions. All Jesus has asked us to do is sow the seed. Amen? He, he just wants us to sow the seed. But uh, maybe this will help you. I don't know. Wouldn't it be good if you had a plan for when somebody actually approaches you and says, what's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists? And you could show them Jesus, right? And, and you could show them the reason and the testimony that you have for your faith in Jesus and wouldn't that be awesome? That's why I do this. Because this tool has been a big help for me. What time is it right now? I want to see how much time i got left. Five, five till four. So we have... Five after? We have ten minutes? Oh, we got... We have... Uh, 445. Good, good. Whew. Man, I was thinking we were going to have, a, have to run here, but that's okay. That's good. Um, here's the deal. As you go out to witness, and I hope that you do witness, instead of sharing Sabbath and veggie links, which is cool, and some people need to hear that, um, just share Jesus. Just share Jesus. And, and you can do that, and, and I do it all kinds of different ways. I meet different people, different situations. Um, we had our house up for sale. A lady came, and she was, she was all um, uh, into New Age stuff, I could tell, by, just by looking at her, you know, and just hearing her talk and all that. And she used to be a realtor and all these things. And and she came in and she said, uh, she was commenting on the Bible. I had it open. I'd been reading my Bible. That's a good thing to do, by the way. And she says, oh, you read your Bible. Are you, uh, you, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, I'm actually a, uh, well, what flavor, basically, is what she was asking. <laughs> and I, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, well, what's the deal with you Seventh-day Adventists, you know? Uh, we just love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus, too. You know, I love Jesus. And I think she loved Jesus, and she probably loved Muhammad, and she probably loved Buddha. She probably loved everything, you know? And that's okay. Um, but we found common ground. You know, and, and I tried to advance the topic a little bit, and it didn't go far. But every chance I get, I'm going to plant a seed about Jesus to somebody. Whether it's a gas station, you know, Walmart thing. I, I stopped this guy one time at a gas station. He's pumping gas. He had a hat on that I recognized because a friend of mine's dad served in Korea. It was a Korean war vet hat. And I asked him, I said, uh, served in Korea. I said, and I stuck out my hand. I said, I really appreciate your service to this country. And I do, by the way. I really do. Supreme sacrifice some of those guys make. And, um, and he says, have you got a minute? I'd like to share a story with you. I said, man, I got a minute. I said, isn't God good? He says, that's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> so we walked around. He sat in his truck 15 minutes. My wife's like, uh, he was telling me this story about him being a prisoner of war and, and his buddies with him. And his buddies one at a time escaped and he was left left over 90 days prisoner of war survived he said the only way i survived was by god's grace <sighs> you never know guy pumping gas at a gas station you might walk away blessed amen, amen. man I was. I was and so so I, I, I guess the whole deal here is don't be scared don't be scared to share a testimony and a word about jesus christ and if this gives you a better game plan on how to do that praise the lord for it it's just a tool that's all it is, okay? Ultimately, the responsibility for witnessing is, is on each one of us. When we are, you know, the call to be a Christian is, is the call to be a witness for Christ. That's what it is. And I'd much rather you be a Christian, and I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to be insulting at all. 
I'd much rather you be a Christian Seventh-day Adventist than a Seventh-day Adventist who's not a Christian. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know that guy. Because I've met some people in, in several churches that had had their names on the books. They were members of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And it was an awesome thing to actually watch them be converted into Christians. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Uh, elder in a church. I wasn't even a pastor yet. Hadn't even gone to school yet, Dr. Hux. And um, I was, uh, I was in, in, in this little church, and um, they asked me to be in a, a head elder and then an associate pastor, and I was there, just a young guy. And uh, one of the elders came to me. He's one of these guys that traveled a lot. He pulled me into a side Sabbath school room. I still remember it. And, um, and he pulled me aside. He said, I found Jesus this weekend. <laughs> He'd been elder in that church 13 years. <laughs> Isn't God good? So, so the call to witness is, is really the call we get when we, when we meet Jesus Christ. And so don't think for a minute, because Satan's going to try to mess you up and get you to think, ah, it's no use, it's, you know, there's too many people out there, my little testimony, my little witness isn't going to make any difference. It will. It will. It could affect somebody's life for eternity. Here's the deal with this whole sanctuary thing. Um, everything that we talk about, even with my neighbor Bill, from, from the from the sacrifice to baptism to the Holy Spirit, and you can get deeper with that stuff if you find somebody that's interested in a certain topic, stop, study it with them, all the way down to Sabbath, because that's where, that's where it's going to be. That's what it crux, the crux is, isn't it? it? It doesn't it always come down to Sabbath. With most people, it's a Sabbath issue, right? Because our culture is built, it's built to trample on the Sabbath. That's where our culture is today. And, and it shouldn't, shouldn't be like that, but it is. And this guy, Yuri Moskala, I attended a class from him. He was a teacher. I don't know if he still is or not at, at, uh, at Andrews. Is he still a teacher up there? He's just a super guy. And he's got this published, and I'm borrowing it. And he said, yeah, hey, anything he's got is, you know, it's Bible, it's good. And, but I want to acknowledge him because this is his deal. And, and it just totally changed my perspective on Sabbath. Totally changed it. And here's why I share this. Oh, by the way, if you want to take some notes here, um, we'll get to that in a minute. But um, here, here's the big reason I do this. Um, I run Camp Your Town Bay, and it's a privilege of mine to run. It's a summer camp. It's in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It's right on an, on an awesome lake, 40,000-acre lake. It's huge. It's massive, 1,000 miles of shoreline. And just the water in the morning is like glass. You get out there and wakeboard. It's just, it's just a blast. And, um, and kids meet Jesus out there on the lake. Isn't that cool? It's an awesome thing. Anyway, um, here's the deal. I could take 10 members from your church, if your church has 10 members. I've been in some that don't. Um, but I could take 10 members from your church, and I could bring them to Camp Yorktown Bay on a Sabbath afternoon in 100-degree weather, bring them down to the lake, and there would be 10 things I could or could not do at the lake on Sabbath afternoon at Camp Yorktown Bay. Because some would say that you can't get in the water today. It's the Sabbath. And some would say, oh, it's okay, you can, you can take your shoes off and uh, you can get your toes wet. Cool them off a little bit because, after all, it's the Sabbath. And some would say, no, 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 it's okay, just pick your pants up and you can get in up to your ankles, after all, it's the Sabbath. Oh, yeah. It's the Sabbath. And some would say, no, 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 I come up to your knees, it's okay. Yeah, you can get them, and you can walk out, as long as your pants don't get wet, after all, it's the Sabbath. Do you know some people? Some people would go and they would change into shorts and they would actually go wade. And they say, oh, you can wade. After all, it's the Sabbath. Ooh, wading, really, on Sabbath? Hmm. And then some would, you know what some would do? Some would say, it's, it's okay to swim as long as you're not having fun. <laughs> After all, it's the Sabbath. And some would say, you know, it's okay to swim as long as your heart rate doesn't get above 165 or so, because then it turns into work, right? <laughs> and, there, and there'd be all these things that you could or couldn't do at the lake on a Sabbath, and who's right and who's wrong, and the Jews had 1,500 laws on Sabbath observance, and we probably have that many, we just don't write them down. Amen? I, I know, I'm hitting nerves probably with some of you, but I know, because I've talked to so many church members about this, I know ladies that were, that they went to the park on Sabbath afternoon, but they couldn't swing on the swings. And you're nodding your head, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's how it was. And, and it's really interesting. And so I really appreciate um, Yuri Moskala sharing this. And, and 
I've got a different perspective a little bit, but I want to show you a couple of things. Genesis 1. You guys have a Bible? Those are good to have, by the way. You can open it up here. I've got it on the screen, um, and the screen's good, but I always just like to read it, if that's okay with you guys. Just want to read it here. Um, it's right at the beginning, and you guys know this because it says in the beginning. It says in the beginning, let me see. I, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And that's a really cool thing because there's a lot going on there. It's a Trinity moment, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all engaged in creation. Um, read John chapter 1 if you want to know if Jesus was there or not. He was right there with him. And, um, and what's really cool, it says that, that planet Earth has a condition to it. It says in verse 2, the Earth was without form. And, and then it says it was void. And that's pretty cool. Um, and here's what I want you to really consider as we finish up here. And we'll, we'll be a few minutes, but um, creation really involves separating in order to bring a planet into unity. And so he's going to separate in order to bring about unity. And you guys have heard that unity through diversity thing. It's a biblical concept, by the way. And we'll watch it happen here. Here's a couple of Hebrew words we can, we can learn today, okay? There's a word for formless, and it's called tohu. Everybody say tohu. tohu. Yeah, not tofu, right? <laughs> tohu. That's really a word. You can look it up in your Strong's Concordance. And, uh, and the word for empty is actually the root is bohu. Yeah, that's fun. Same together, tohu, bohu. Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? Hey, you guys speak in Hebrew. That's good. Um, yeah, tohu, bohu. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use this little pyramid here. By the way, this is a chiasm. If you are not familiar with chiastic structures, uh, look it up sometime. I don't have time to explain it. If this is an ABC, ABC. A structure here that we're going to see, and you see a lot in Hebrew literature. It's definitely there in creation. It's plain, and you can just draw that. It might be a little easier for you on your scratch piece of paper if you want to. It may be helpful for you to remember it later. You'll see it as we go here. It's kind of going to get stuck on the screen here. But we're going to keep it real simple, cradle roll style. How many of you were raised up in cradle roll class? It's okay. Don't be embarrassed. It's all right. They call it beginner class now, right? I wasn't, by the way. I'm out when it comes to that. But we're going to keep it real simple because here's what I found, too. Um, I go and I do guest speaking engagements at different churches and, you know, week of prayers and all that kind of stuff. And people hit me after church, you know. And, um, and they, they'll tell me things like, I'm not getting anything out of church. Um, maybe this is you. I don't know. I'm not getting blessed. I'm not getting fed at my church. And my response to them is always, what are you bringing to potluck? And they think I'm talking about food, but, but no, if you're going to get a blessing, you better bring one. Amen? And so if you're coming to church empty-handed, you're probably going to leave empty-handed. But if you're in his word all week and you're engaged in witnessing all week, you're going to come to church brimming. And you're going to be saying, man, I witnessed to this guy at Walmart. You wouldn't believe what happened. And people, when they hear that, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be blessed. Amen? And so bring a blessing, you'll get a blessing. That's the way it works. If nobody brought a dish to potluck, everybody would go home hungry which may not be a bad thing sometimes anyway, but, um, but it's not good spiritually for sure. So here's the deal. Um, with cradle roll, uh, I, I tell people this because some people will ask me, they'll say, um, Pastor, I need your help. Well, what can I do for you? Well, I, Sabbath school teacher, man, I just, uh, there's only one Sabbath school class, adult Sabbath school class. I don't get anything out of Sabbath school class. And, and, and I'm just, I just gotten to the point where I don't even want to go. You know what I tell them to do? Go to cradle roll. Go to cradle roll. How many, when was the last time you guys were in cradle roll class? Because I can tell you how long it's been for me. Uh-huh. Because you know what I do when I go to church? I go to cradle roll. Do you know why? Because you're going to learn the simple songs of faith, and you're going to bang the sticks if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. That's one thing that's kind of crazy. We tell the kids, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. They go to church, something makes them happy, and they, oh, we don't clap in church. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, Sabbath school. Go to those Sabbath school classes with the little kids. Sing the songs, color, make the little cutout things, glue some stuff. When's the last time you played with glue and crayons? Go do it. You'll find Jesus in a whole new way. It will maybe bring out the Jesus that's already in you that's just yearning to get out. So if, you're, if adult Sabbath school isn't getting it for you, go, go to the cradle roll class. It's a lot of fun. And um, you're going to find that it is. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to build our chart here, and we're going to look at creation week. We're going to stay in Genesis chapter 1 and a little bit in Genesis chapter 2. And so we're going to make this an open book test. And honestly, if I had some young kids in here, some cradle roll kids, 
they answer these. I go to churches and do this presentation at churches, and the little kids, <laughs> the ones that are five, four, three, they answer these questions. They know the answers, okay? So it's kind of fun. Um, somebody tell me what happens the first day of creation. Light, yeah, God said, let there be light, right? Everybody knows that. And actually, if you read the text, I'm not going to read it. I don't have all that time, but it's right there in front of you. It actually says that God separates light from darkness is what he does. He separates them. He says there ought to be a distinction between light and darkness. And I believe that he did that for a number of reasons. I believe one of the big reasons that he did that is because Jesus thinks that people of light ought to be different than people of darkness. Amen? And John uses that light-dark imagery a ton in, in his gospel. And, um, and, and we're told to be light and we're supposed to shine in the darkness. And unfortunately, most of us have our dimmer switches turned way down because we don't want to stand out. And you ought to ask yourself a few questions. If I'm shopping in the same stores, eating the same food, renting the same movies, visiting the same internet websites, and, and driving the same car, if I'm doing all those same things as my heathen, pork-eating, Sabbath-breaking friends, am I light? Just a question. You can answer it on your own sometime. But day one, the Lord says there ought to be a difference between light and darkness. And he creates a form. Remember, the Lord said the earth is formless and it's empty. And he's going to build a form here on the left side of the screen. And then he's going to fill that form. You remember this, don't you, Dr. Hux? Yep. Day two. Oh, I should back that up. What's he do on day two? Somebody tell me. Yeah, you saw it. I know. It's okay. Yeah, he separates the water above from the water beneath. King James, Version uses that, King James Version uses that big word called firmament. It's sky is what it is. It's cradle roll class, okay? It's sky. And, uh, and so he separates water above from water beneath, puts the sky there, and I'm glad that he did that because without our atmosphere, we'd be gone in 10 seconds, right? Radiation from the sun, solar winds, all that would be toast. And so he needed a form, and he separates stuff. He separates water above from water beneath. What's he do on day three? Vegetation and something else. Yeah, he separates. He separates dry land from water, right? Dry land appears. That's where the plants spring up from. And so we have earth and vegetation. And what we did right now, what the Lord just did in three days, is that he built planet earth as a form there, but it's empty. It's empty. And so what he begins to do on day four is to fill the form that he created. And this is that chiastic structure that I'm talking about. We're going to go down here next. And you're going to be able to see what the Lord fills, what he puts in that form. Okay, so there's a form of light and darkness. Now somebody tell me on day four what he, what he creates on day four. Sun, moon, and stars. Yeah, lesser light, greater light. Sun, moon, and stars. So you see he had a form of light and darkness and he needed to fill that form. And so he uses the sun, moon, and stars to fill the form that he created. Does that make sense? Make sense? Good. Um, what do you think he does on day five? He has a form called water and sky, and he creates fish and birds to fill the form. Isn't God smart? Yeah, a lot smarter than I am. Um, definitely. He fills the form that he made because he's going to try to create a planet that's unified, that is in unity with itself and, uh, and so he does something special, really, on day six. Somebody tell me what he creates on day six. Yeah, animals and man, right? And he does man a little different than he does animals, and you can look at it in Scripture there and see for yourself. With everything else, he speaks into creation with man. You remember what he does? Yeah, he gets down on his hands and knees there. I play with Play-Doh. Do you guys ever play with Play-Doh? I still do. I keep cans of it in my office. I give it to kids that I study with and stuff. Um, I don't have any with me, and I'm kind of jonesing for some right now, actually. <laughs> but that's what the Lord did here. He, he, he formed man. He, he got his hands dirty, got down on his hands and knees, and he formed him. And, and then the Bible says that he breathed into his nostrils. Now, you ever try to do that to somebody? You maybe have somebody done that to you after they've had a garlic and onion sandwich, right? <laughs> You ever get anybody where that's close talker and you try to back up and they keep coming? You know? <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> you know, the only way you can really breathe into somebody's nostrils is if there's contact there. Some of you know CPR. And, and that's really what the Lord does there with Adam. It's an intimate contact that he has. He kisses him awake, really. And, and he says, you're different because you're made in my image. And you have a character that's totally different from the animals. But here's something that you might want to take a note of, too. Those of you who are concerned about this that God designs animals and man to live on the earth 
and eat the plants. Yeah, he, he didn't design animals and man to live on the earth and eat each other. That wasn't his plan because his original plan, there was to be no death in his original plan. And so this is, this is what the Lord designed. And it's an awesome thing. And even in mankind, the Lord separates in order to bring about unity. You remember Adam looks at all the animals go by, you know, from aardvark to zebra, I guess, A to Z. And he says, there's none for me. And, and the Lord does the first surgery with anesthesia, puts him to sleep, does a ribectomy, and, and he forms woman. And Adam wakes up and he says, Lord, you did good, right? You did, re you did real good. And, um, and Adam actually breaks into song there, by the way, in, in your Bible. That's, that's a song that he sings, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, you'll be called woman. She was taken out of man. And, and the Lord separated, it is, it really is. And the Lord separated to bring about unity. Two can become one flesh, right? With the Lord, one plus one equals one. Yeah, one. And you guys say that cheesy stuff to your girlfriends. Hopefully you still say it to your wives. You complete me, right? You still say, she's, you st does he still say that to you? Does he? All right, you need to start if you don't. Um, yeah, you complete me. We say that sappy stuff, but it's true, right? Eve completed, completed Adam. Without him, really, he was not a complete man. So here's the deal. Um, we're going to get into day seven, and to do that, we're going to look at a couple of verses, and we'll try to go through this. What time is it? I don't want to run, I don't run over. 25. Great. We're doing good. All right, here's the deal. Uh, it's Genesis. You guys have your Bible? Chapter 2. Yeah, verse 1, 2, and 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. New King James Version. You might have a version that reads a little bit different. Um, but that's the version that I chose. It's the one that I read most of the time. And uh, I, I get a lot of... Uh, uh, fun and enjoyment out of reading scriptures. I hope that you do as well. hope that it's a habit for you. It's, um, it, it, I've really, um, here lately, I've just been kind of soaking up the word, uh, reading the book of Acts again and again, and it's just, anyway, um, I, I told my, 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 uh, my staff at summer camp, because um, we have staff worship at 6.45 a.m., and uh, they grab their Bible and they come to staff worship. It's a required meeting for them. And I told them if they'll keep that habit after they leave camp, it, it'll be an awesome thing for them. One of them um, was on their day off, and they woke up in the afternoon, and they grabbed their Bible, and they started walking up to the calf. She said, I was halfway up there before I realized, oh, it's not staff worship. It was a habit. She woke up and grabbed her Bible. Isn't that a great thing? Yeah, that's an awesome thing. That's what you ought to do. That's what, what everybody needs to do. But here's the deal. Um, we looked at those verses. And it says that the heavens and the earth were finished, and we looked at it, and everything is finished. And the, and the Lord says, this thing worked out good. And we're going to notice that the Lord really does three things here on this seventh day. And I highlighted the word there, rested. And I know that several of you, after church, you go home and you get your rest on. Lay activities, what we call them, right? Um, I'm familiar with that. And that's not what that word means. That's not what it means. Do you think the Lord was tired? Nah, the Lord neither sleeps nor slumbers. He definitely was not tired. How many of you ever made a, um, something out of Play-Doh? Or maybe you, uh, maybe you made a lasagna that turned out just right, or you baked a cake and you iced it and that thing turned out just right, or you folded up a paper airplane and that thing just went just right, or maybe it was a Lego creation, um, or you made your bed and you thought, man, it looks like, and you just sat back for a minute after and you went, man, that turned out good. Anybody in here ever done that? Those of you without your hand up, you need to go do something, okay? <laughs> Anything, do something, okay? No, that's what, the, that's what that means. It, it means that the Lord just sat back and he looked and he says, that went about as good as it could have ever gone. And really, when you see how it all went together, it did, didn't it? It did. Everything fit together perfect. There was a, there was a form, it was filled, and he says, and he sat back and he's really resting in the knowledge that, that things went according to plan. And that's a beautiful thing. I really appreciate that. And then it says God does something else. It says that he blessed the seventh day. Now, you can look through Genesis chapter 1, invite you to, encourage you to, actually, um, to look through there and try to find a blessing that's attached to day 1 or day 2 or day 3. or day, You won't find it. You won't find it. And here's what the Lord does. He uses a, a form called time, 24 hours, and he attaches a blessing to a certain day. 
It's a special blessing that he attaches to that day, that 24-hour period of time. Now, can I be blessed if I worship God on Monday? Yes, I can. I did this Monday, actually, and I was blessed. Can I be blessed if I worship God on Tuesday? What about Sunday? Yes. Can I get that blessing if I worship God on Thursday? No, I can't. I can't get that blessing because that blessing is attached to a certain 24-hour period of time that I can't get anywhere else. There's several blessings, special blessings in Scripture. Uh, Book of Revelation has a blessing there for those who read, understand, obey the prophecies contained in the Book of Revelation. I can't get that blessing if I'm reading the Book of Luke. Can't get it. The only way I can get that blessing is if I'm reading the prophecies of the Book of Revelation. And so this blessing is attached to a special period of time that the Lord set aside. I didn't do it, he did it. And I believe that he did it because he wanted the entire world to receive a blessing. The entire world in unity to receive this blessing. So what else does he do? Well, it says that he sanctified it. And that's a cool word, sanctified. Yours may say that he uh, um, made it holy. Different translations do different things with that. Um, sanctified means set aside for holy use. And it's a cool thing. I was in uh, Greece in 2003, and um, I did uh, biblical Hebrew over there that summer. And Dr. Lloyd Willis was there as my teacher. He's a really cool guy, archaeologist. And we had a lot of fun. But uh, there's a lot of uh, Greek Orthodox, by the way, is, is the religion in that country. 98% of the population is Greek Orthodox. They've got a, I mean, they've got a landlock. There's one Adventist church there, about 300 members, I think. Okay, 20 million people in Greece. Uh, Pray for our Greek Adventist friends, amen? Yeah, and it's tough there because they won't let you hold meetings and all that stuff. They've got to do what we just talked about, right? Meet somebody, hey, what do you, isn't God good? Yeah, isn't he great, you know? And that's the only way they can do it there, okay? So pray for them. But I went into one of those, and they got beautiful churches, went into one of those Greek Orthodox churches. They got this basin of water when you go in. Some of you know what I'm talking about already. And uh, I knew what it was, but I wanted to hear it from the priest. The priest was there, and I had a translator with me because my Greek was New Testament Greek, and it wasn't conversational Greek. And, um, and so I, I asked him what this is. And, okay, I asked him, uh, holy water. I knew that, okay. Um, and I said, how did it get holy? What made it holy? Isn't that a good question? I I thought it was. I wanted to know what what made it holy. It says God made that day holy. What made it holy? How does it get holy? And so there's water here. He says it's holy. How did it get holy? And the priest said it's holy because I blessed it. And I thought, that's interesting. And so I studied. I began to study that, and I realized that that's not how something gets made holy. That's not how something gets made holy. Exodus chapter 3. You guys have the probably know this story. Um, now we'll just blow through this. We've already done this. There's only one, Exodus chapter 3. This is that story. It's that story of Moses. You guys remember Moses? 40 years in Egypt. Um, took his aggression out on somebody he shouldn't have. Right? Yeah, it took somebody's life and ran for his own life. Spent 40 years there in Midian. He's, he's a shepherd and he sees something he's never seen before in his whole life. And, um, and it's really cool dialogue and language that takes place there in Exodus chapter 3 when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see the sight. There's a lot of seeing going on. Um, that, that Moses approaches this burning bush. You remember that story? He approaches that burning bush and a voice calls to him from the bush and says, Moses, take off your... From off the, because the place you're standing is holy ground. Holy ground. Now, what made it holy? Was it the fire or the bush? The presence of God. Ah, the presence of God. Thank you so much. I want you to see what the Lord does here with the Sabbath here, with the seventh day. He sets apart, by the way, this uh, Ellen White calls the Sabbath, for those of you interested in what Ellen White says, she calls it a sanctuary of time. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Sanctuary of time. And here's what the Lord does, is that he sets aside this time, this blessing, and he fills it with his presence. He fills it with his presence. And so God is present on the Sabbath in a way that he isn't present any other day of the week. Now, I'm not saying that God's not with us on Monday. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is God is present in a unique way on Sabbath to bless those people who will take the time in a unique way. 
in a unique way. There's, there's a special blessing attached to that Sabbath. Now, let's look at this. Recognizing God is present in the Sabbath in a way that he isn't present every other day should cause us to think differently about how those Sabbath hours are spent. And what I do or do not do on the Sabbath should be filtered through this understanding. Now, can I go into the lake on the Sabbath? Are you convicted not to? Yeah. See, that's tough, isn't it? Well, here's what I was going to do. I was... Um, and I'm, I don't have time to share my testimony with you. It's colorful. I'll share that with you. Um, at any rate, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I came in kicking and screaming. I actually tried to prove every doctrine wrong. That's how I became convicted, literally. And, um, and so when I was in, I was in. And I wasn't going anywhere. And, and my lifestyle changed. My habits had to change. And, uh, and the Lord began to... <laughs> I'm 42. I just turned 42. I have a son that's 23, married in college up in St. Louis, and a daughter that's 15. Uh, it's been 16 years since my conversion. Um, the Lord did something really cool because what he did is he, he began to teach me and show me some things in my life where I was living outside of his will. Isn't that awesome when he does that? And, and it, I'll, I will share this part with you. When I met Jesus, there were some things that immediately I knew were outside of his will. Okay? Uh, heinous things that... That, that were way outside of his will. And when I was baptized, I was done with those things. And then, wouldn't you know it, the Lord began to reveal other areas of my life that were outside of his will, but they were little things. You hear me? Yeah, they were just little things. Not, not big things like those other things. And I wish I could stand here and tell you that immediately when he convicted me of those things, I surrendered those things, but I didn't. It took me years to deal with those little things because I thought it's just a little thing. Look where I was and look where I am. This is just little stuff. And you know what I found is that there's people that backpack that junk around with them for their whole life. Man, let that stuff go. What do you think it's, you think it's doing you any good? <laughs> Wasn't doing me any good. But anyway, here's the deal. Um, this, this, whole, this whole thing was, I was in the church about a year and a half. We, they did another evangelistic series. Can you imagine a church that does evangelistic series once a year? Yeah, it's a pretty good thing. And, um, and new people were coming into the church, and I saw them and heard them talking about things that they were doing on Sabbath, going out to eat, watching a movie, and I was like, whoa. I said, man, I told my wife, I said, uh, I need to write a book on, on what to do and what not to do on the Sabbath. I think it would be helpful for people. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. I discovered, maybe the Lord showed me that you can't write that book. You can't write that book. Because, because if the Lord is present on the Sabbath, and I recognize that he's present in a way to bless me, then all the activities that I do or don't do need to be focused on, am I receiving the blessing right now that the Lord would have me to have right now? Can I be blessed being engaged in this activity or not? The Sabbath, I believe, is God's great unifier. I still believe that today. At the beginning, that was His plan for all flesh to stop everything they were doing and come and worship Him. I know what sin has done, and I know that the Sabbath right now is a divisive thing. That's why we wait till day 26 in our 27 or 28 night meetings to introduce the Sabbath. Amen? Because it's a divisive thing with a lot of people. But I believe the Sabbath is God's great unifier. And I also believe that it's the hours of the Sabbath when God is especially present that offer us time to become one with our Creator and become one with each other. The Sabbath. Is, is God's time with us in a unique way. And, and if we just fritter away those hours of the Sabbath and just kind of waste them, sleep the day away or whatever, man, we have, we have just, it'd be like you getting, uh, how much time do I have? Do I have a few minutes? 10 minutes, good. Picture yourself as a young man, some of you guys. <laughs> I remember it wasn't so long ago. Um, and, and you get up the guts finally to ask Sally Joe out on a date. And, it's, uh, and, and you, you, you walk up to Sally Joe and you say, gee, I think you're swell, you know. And, uh, and would you possibly might want to go out with me next Thursday? And she says, okay. And you go, okay, that's cool. I'll pick you up. How about 7 o'clock? Would that be okay? Yeah, 7 o'clock is fine. That's good. Okay. And as soon as she leaves, you go, yes, right? And now you got a week, next Thursday, next Thursday, 7 o'clock, and you start planning your week. 
And this guy really wants to make an impression on Sally Jo. He wants to develop a relationship. He wants to spend some time with her. And he wants her to really get to know him. And he wants to get to know her. And so he begins to plan. And the first thing he does, he goes home and he starts pulling out his clothes because he's going to find something good to wear. And he can't find anything. So he tells mom, Mom, I'm going shopping. When you go shopping, I need to find a new shirt, new pair of pants, and even some new shoes. She says, for what? I got a date with Sally Jo. She goes, okay. So he goes and he finds some nice clothes because he wants to look smooth, you know. And he, he spends some money. Spends money, saving it up, you know, he's going to do some stuff with his car, an old Pinto that he drove, and he was going to do some stuff, get some rims, and all. he says, ah, it's Sally Joe. I'm going to pull out all the stops, buy some nice clothes, goes home and makes sure they get ironed right, and he looks in it, nice, nice, Sally Joe, this is going to be nice, so I got to make reservations, calls ahead, makes reservations at the nice restaurant in town, the expensive one where you have to wear a suit, you know, one of those kind of deals, and um, he calls ahead, makes sure he's got those reservations, that's good, that's done. Awesome. Um, what else I got to do next day? You know, I got to do some. Ooh, you know what? I need to get her a card. I need to write, I need to write her a love note. And so he goes to a Walmart and he checks out the racks, 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 cards. And he's looking. At, he can't find one that says just the right thing. Spends hours there, you know. Just can't quite find it there. And he's like, man, what am I going to do? Hallmark. Goes to Hallmark. Checks it. Now, they're good, but they're not quite right. And so he says, ooh, you know what? At home, I got that calligraphy set my mom got me about three years ago. I, I'm going to, I still got five days. I'm going to learn calligraphy. I'm going to write my own note. I'm going to write my own love letter. This guy's over the top, isn't he? <laughs> Guys, if I'm raising the bar for you, I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> so he goes home, and he starts to practice, and he runs back by the stationery store, and he gets some really nice parchment paper. He's going to make this thing nice, you know? He brings that home, and he starts practicing, and then he's getting all this stuff, and he goes, oh, I, I need to get her some flowers. And so he goes to Walmart, and he looks at those $9.99 bouquet, and he says... I'm not getting those cheap flowers for my, for my girl. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And he goes to the florist, 85 bucks, dozen roses, 85 bucks. Can, can I pick those up on Thursday night about 630? Because I'm going to pick her up at 7. So, oh, that's fine. We'll have them ready for you. Awesome, 85 bucks. Eh, that's okay. It's for Sally Joe. It's worth it, right? It's worth it. Got to impress this girl. And so he goes home, practices calligraphy a little more, and he goes, oh, chocolate. Girls like chocolate. They do, right? Oh, my wife does. She loves chocolate. So he goes to Walmart, and he's looking in the, nah, not that Walmart chocolate. He goes, and he finds that Godiva chocolate. Yeah. Ah, yeah, the good stuff. Yeah, gold foil wrap, yeah. And he gets her the big box of Godiva chocolates. He wants to bless her, you know? That's what he wants. He wants to be a blessing. And so he, he takes those home. He sets them on his dresser, careful. They gift wrapped them for him. It's beautiful, you know, bow on the top. And he's, yes, got that. And he's working on his calligraphy more, and he's got that thing just right. And he makes a beautiful love note for her. And he goes outside, and it's, uh, it's like a Wednesday afternoon, and he's, he's shining up his pinto. <laughs> and he says, this ain't going to work. He goes in the house, and he picks up the phone, and he makes a reservation for a limousine. Whoa. What do you think about this guy? <laughs> he is a nut, isn't he? In a good way, though, right? Yeah, he just wants to, he just wants to be a blessing to this girl. And, and everything falls into place. Gets his hair cut, shines his shoes, puts on his clothes. The, the, the limousine shows up. He's got his chocolates. Takes him to the flower shop, picks up the flowers. He's got his note. And he goes and he pulls up to Sally's house at 5 till 7. Reservations are made down to He's set. He is set. And he goes and he knocks on the door. And the, and the limo driver says, dude, you're looking sharp. I said, thanks, man. I'm nervous. He said, no, don't be nervous. You look sharp. Go ahead. And he, and he goes and he knocks on the door. And he just walks up to the door and he goes. And then he's got to stand back and look cool, you know. It's hard to look cool when you're carrying chocolates and flowers, but he does it, you know, because he wants to be a blessing. And he just wants to get to know her. And nobody answers the door. And he's a little bit louder. She's probably doing her hair. Yeah, probably. And then the door pops open, and there's Sally Jo. And she's wearing sweats and a T-shirt with Cheetos smeared on it, pulling her iPod out of her ear. And she says, what are you doing here? He says, we had a date, remember? And she says, oh, was that today? Can we reschedule? Sabbath. Sabbath. The Lord just wants to bless us that day. He set it aside. He's made a date with humanity for that day. And, and he wrote a love letter 
And, and he has all these ways that he's just wanting to bless us, to spend time with us, to magnify his love towards us and us for him. And, and we just say, uh, it's, can we just reschedule? I just, I just feel like taking a nap today. I don't, I don't really want to spend that much time with you. Maybe you can just come in, we can listen to watch a DVD or something. I don't know. Hang out. Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah, Sabbath. It's no ordinary day. And, and we can't attain that blessing by worshiping on any day that we choose. And, and we, we do understand this, right? That keeping, keeping Sabbath can't save us. We, we saw that, right? It can't save us. Only the grace and mercy of Jesus can do that. Because Jesus loves us, he gives us salvation. You guys believe that? Amen. I do. I believe that. Because he wants us to develop love for him, he gives us the Sabbath. That's why. We need, to, we need time. And nobody has time anymore, believe me, I know. Nobody has time. And so the Lord set aside 24 hours that he just wants to devote in relationship with us. That's all he wants. Just some time. So, Sabbath, huh? Maybe Jesus. We've got, um, we've got about five minutes. And if you guys have questions or comments, I think there's a survey thing that you guys are supposed to fill out. Make sure you fill one of those out, okay? Um, but if you've got questions that you want to shoot at me, three minutes, the guy's telling me back there, then I'd be happy to take your questions. Um, I'm hopeful this, this helps you a little bit. Uh, it helps me. Uh, you know, that's, it's, it's always, uh, uh, it's, to me, it's always easier when I have a plan of attack. And, um, and there were a few times in my early years of Adventism where people would challenge me, what's the deal with you Adventists? And I'd, and I'd throw Sabbath and veggie links at them, you know, as good as the next guy. And, um, but really it's about Jesus, isn't it? It's all about Jesus and what he's done for us. Yes, ma'am. I am patient and I need a survey. You need a survey. I got some right here. I can give that for you. Yep. They're back there in the back, too, if you need some. Yes, sir. I got one. I've been sharing a similar type thing with people where it's when you get into the sanctuary house, the, the showbread and the, and the, the lampstand is the, the new covenant where God light writes his laws on our hearts. Amen. Amen. So that going up to that altar, he then calls us to the altar stand with him to intercede on others and ask that we can all be together. Co laborers with Christ. But the, the point there is to bring others in so we can all be together. Amen. To have fellowship, right? Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Um, here's, here's what I want to leave you with because, um, because I want you to get this. Whether you witness or not, Jesus still loves you. Do you understand that? that there's nothing you can do to make him love you any less and nothing you can do to make him love you any more. He loves you with a perfect love. But if you are called to be a Christian, then your calling is to witness. That's, that's, it, it ought to be a part of who you are. And, and it shouldn't be that you're forced to. And I'm not saying that, that the call to be a Christian makes an introvert an extrovert. I'm not saying that. But you need to, you need to witness in the sphere that you're in. Whatever that is, okay? Some people say, man, I just, I just really have a really hard time. And I've met some people who have a really hard time talking to somebody. Live a Christian life, amen? Put Jesus on display every day. Because I'd much rather see a sermon than hear one any day, amen? So here's what I'd like to do as we close. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for you. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, that guy, he shut me down. And, and you can't force your way in. He, he just shut me down. Um, his whole body language and everything else. He said, I guess if you're into that kind of stuff. And he just kind of, he shut me down, turned his body, just kind of rang up my groceries. I only had two or three things, and that was it. He was done. 
It happens. You know, Jesus, Jesus didn't call us to convert anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. What he called us to do was witness. That's what he wanted us to do. Here's what I'd like to do. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a write-up on this approach? I don't have anything written. Would be nice to have some written. I can do that. I can get it to, to one of these guys here. I can type something up for you. That's not a problem. Yep. Okay. Yep. I think, you know, and, and, and like I said, some people are more receptive than others. Some people, it's hard to find common ground with. What I'd like to do is challenge you guys. And then I'll, then I'll take your question, Jesse. Um, and and I, don't, I don't do this lightly. But what I'd like to do, if you guys, and I'd rather you stay seated and be honest than stand up and be a liar. Okay, I want you to tell you this right now. But if you guys would, would, would like to rededicate or recovenant really with me your your witness to Jesus Christ. In other words, if you're willing to say that from now on I'm going to be much more intentional in my witness, then then I just want you to stand up because I just want to pray with you. I just want to pray you up. And and really just standing up is just saying, look Jesus, I'm going to be more intentional with my witnessing. If this helps you, this blueprint in the sanctuary, praise the Lord. If you've got your own thing that's working, hey use that, okay? But but just by standing, we're just saying, Lord Put somebody across our path and just help us be faithful to speak. Because you know the cool thing is, as Jesus says, when we go, he'll give us the words to speak. So it's not even us speaking anymore. He just, he just kind of takes over. So let's, let's pray here.